Hey, buddy, watch this. Hello, hello, Regis Kilbin is the name, and Hearthstone is the game. This is part three of my One Night in Karazhan card review. This time around, I've got three new cards that were just revealed. Uh, Prince Malkazar, Protect the King, and Kara Kazam. And I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. Starting off with Prince Malkazar, the new legendary. Uh, this is a nifty card. Uh, most people think it's going to be bad. And I understand why, and I'll get into that. But I have some hope for this card. Uh, starting off, it's a 5 mana, 5-6, five, which is good. Um, a lot of people say that's a vanilla stat line. Pit Fighter has those stats, and it's not like you're playing Pit Fighter in many decks, and that's true. But it's a big distinction that it's a 5 mana, 5-6 five, versus a 5 mana, 5-5. Five, five. 6 health is a lot better than 5, both because it's harder to kill for a lot of cards, but it also trades into a lot of 5-5s five that exist in the game. So that's a, that's an intriguing little upside and an important distinction. So this card is playable on curve, I think. Uh, the, real, the real downside of this card in many ways is its effect. And now most people are going to say, downside? What are you talking about? This card has an amazing upside. You add five legendaries to your deck, dude. You're making your deck so much better with five new legendaries. And uh, I understand why that might be your initial reaction, but I think that actually that's a downside. That's a problem with this card uh, for 99% of decks. Uh, primarily for a couple reasons, right? First off, the average legendary is not quite as good as you might think. Um, there's a lot of Lorewalker Chos and uh, Shifter Zerises and, and a lot of kind of middling legendaries that don't see play. I mean, think about how many legendaries go in like a control deck. What are there? There's four or five um, in most control decks. That's because class cards do more important and more specific things that legendaries don't do. So you're not really going to be that excited to see the average legendary. Of course, there will be instances you get the Ragnaros or the Tyrion or whatever else, and you're super pumped that you got an extra Rag or an extra Tyrion. I get it, but you'll also sometimes draw a Lorewalker Cho when you need a very specific card in your deck. So essentially, when you shuffle five Legendaries into your deck, you're making it less likely to draw all of the specific cards that you picked, all the cards you like. You put them in there for a reason, and now they're harder to find. So it's a big risk... To add extra cards to your deck. Frankly, if you could run a 15 or 10 card deck, you might do that because you could find stuff very consistently and predictably and, and just settle on the very best cards that you have because you don't always draw all 30 cards, right? Sometimes you only draw 10 or 15 and win the game. So it, it essentially it makes your deck harder to parse through, harder to get the good stuff, more inconsistent, all of which are problems. Now, I should note, uh, there were a couple distinctions about this card that have already been addressed by Blizzard. This effect happens at the beginning of the game. You don't have to find Prince Malkazar. You don't have to play him. As long as he's in your deck, this text is relevant at the beginning of the game. So the very start of the game, you're going to have 35 cards in your deck instead of 30. So unlike a card like Elise Starseeker that you can control when she turns stuff into legendaries... You don't get to control it with this card. It makes your deck uh, more inconsistent right from the start. So the great distinction and great thing about Elise is that uh, once you get to the end of the game and you've got some leftover cards that either don't, don't fit into what your game plan is at that point or don't address your opponent's cards very well or don't fit into your opponent's play style very well, you can just turn them into Ragnaros. You can turn it into Lorewalker Cho and it's not a loss because the card was useless anyway. The problem with Prince Malkazar is that it makes those good cards harder to find. Uh, so, very different effect. I don't think it's really fair to compare the two. They're not really doing the same thing or designed to do the same thing. So, he he's probably worse than Elise Starseeker most of the time. Another distinction with this card that Blizzard made is that the legendaries will not be duplicates. So, I guess you can't actually get two Tyrians. Uh, they will only add... Uh, class and neutral cards that that you can play in the deck. So in other words, if you're a warrior, you can't get Tyrion. 
uh, but you can get any of the neutral cards, any of the warrior legendaries. But they won't add duplicates. So if you pick the five legendaries you really like, uh, you're going to get, at the very best, the five next worst, or the next best legendaries, right? You're not going to get um, the same good ones again. So that's another issue is that you're kind of already picking the ones you like and that fit your deck, and then you're getting something worse than that added in. So that's another downside. Um, but let me go ahead and discuss that all that said, most people are saying this card's unplayable, doesn't do enough, it hurts your deck, the stats aren't good enough, the effect is too slow, demon synergy is irrelevant, that's what everybody's saying, I've been reading a lot of comments. But I actually think that this card will spawn a totally new archetype of decks. And I shouldn't say totally new, because they have existed to some extent before, and of course I'm talking about fatigue decks. We've seen like fatigue warriors, seen like some grinder slash fatigue mages in the past. Uh, I think that this card is so good at winning fatigue games that you will see an entire archetype carved out because of Prince Malkazar, and I think it will mostly be warriors, as if warrior needed another way to successfully ladder. I actually think what will happen is that the deck will have to be essentially more or less 29 removal and defensive cards and then Prince Malkazar. So in other words, maybe an Elise Star Seeker too. <laughs> uh, in other words, you have to know for a fact that you're going to get the removal that you need to survive the game to fatigue. You have to be able to live. You have to be able to answer every threat that your opponent puts on the board. So you'll need single target removal. You'll need area of effect removal. You'll need defensive heal and armor cards. And you will you won't need threats. You won't need to play your own minions because Prince Malkazar is essentially going to be something that generates you five extra threats but also makes you so ridiculously good at combating fatigue especially as a warrior who already has so much armor to combat fatigue, that you'll just win games. Your opponent will run out of resources. Uh, they'll run out of cards. They'll fatigue faster than you by five spots at the very best, uh, and sometimes even more if they overdraw or draw too much. Uh, and, and you'll have a ton of armor to rely on too, so it'll just be an instant win condition and fatigue. Now the question is, is can you put together... A warrior deck with you know 25, 26 removal cards, and maybe Justicar Trueheart and Elise Starseeker and Prince Malkazar, and can you make it competitive? In other words, can you find enough removal? You've got shield slams, executes, you got bashes, you got shield blocks, you got weapons, you've got tons of stuff, but is there enough to basically outlast every deck in the game? And can you draw it consistently enough? Because Prince Malkazar will occasionally get you those three straight draws where you get uh, Nefarian and uh, Nazdormu and Ysera on turns two, three, and four. So th that's the risk, right? Is that he could just cost you some games arbitrarily by uh, making you draw those cards all in the wrong order. Or you might just not have the kinds of removal necessary. But if you can build a, a you know, 26, 27, 28 card list... With, with good enough removal and survivability cards, I think Prince Malkazar gives you an instant win condition. Although, when I say instant, I really mean 40-minute win condition because it's going to take forever for those games to play out. So that's going to be the first thing I try with this card. And uh, if those resources don't exist, if you can't find a list that can combat the meta and, and last to fatigue, I agree Prince Malkazar is probably a subpar card it's pretty bad. Because uh, really, the five extra legendary minions don't do anything uh, unless you play to fatigue. Because theoretically, you don't see them. They're just swapping out another good card in your deck. And uh, his stats and his board impact aren't enough. If he was like a taunt, maybe he'd be even better. But since he's not, uh, he just doesn't do enough the turn he's played and makes your deck worse. So outside of that very specific instance with fatigue decks, I agree he's a bad card. Otherwise, he might actually spawn the best deck in the game. So, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we might end up hating Prince Malkazar if we're able to find a good list in a class that supports that playstyle. So Priest and Warrior spring to mind. Uh, particularly Priest with stuff like Entomb. It makes their deck even longer for fatigue. But they can't build the armor resources of Warrior, so that's the one downside. But anyway... I- Again, a very interesting card, a very divisive card. Um, I'm very curious to see how this one pans out. I'd like to hear your thoughts on Prince Malkazar if you have them. I've certainly shared enough of my own. So let's go ahead and move on to the next two cards in uh, part three of my review here. Up first is Protect the King, a new warrior spell. This is basically Unleash the Dudes. (laughs) Instead of Unleash the Hounds, you get to Unleash Dudes, but a very similar functionality. Uh, but your pawns, instead of your hounds, spawn with taunt and not charge. And I do think that makes this card substantially worse. Because the great thing about Unleash the Hounds is that uh, they have charge, so you get to attack with them in the turn you play them. Which means you can dictate the kinds of trades they make. In other words, if you need to kill a huffer, you can kill the huffer. You can kill the 4-2. Um... And you can send the rest to face, or you can pick off one health stuff, whatever you want to do, but you get to choose. The problem with Protect the King is that uh, you kind of just send your pawns out there, and your opponent dictates how to trade and how to work with them. Now, obviously, if they have the same number of minions, they're going to be able to kill all of your dudes in the same turn, unless you use something like Fiery War X or whatever. Uh, and, and they'll get to trade. Their Huffer will survive as a 4-1. Uh, They might have a Mortal Coil to kill one of your dudes and send Huffer to face, for instance, for four damage lethals. Uh, So it's just much worse that you don't get to dictate the trades. You're leaving it up to your opponent. Uh, Plus, the great thing about Unleash the Hounds is you can kill your Hounds off instantly by making good trades so that they're not susceptible to whirlwind effects or any sort of board clear, any AoE. Uh, With this card, you send them out there, and Ravaging Ghoul destroys them all. So uh, they're very susceptible to AoE. That said, uh, I think this card is substantially worse than something like Unleash the Hounds. Uh, It's worse than Muster for Battle, which is kind of a sideways comparison as well, because you don't have the guaranteed weapon, and um, you don't have a guaranteed number of dudes either. Sometimes there might just be one guy on the opponent's side of the board, and this card is a really bad 3-mana (laughs) 1-1. Uh, It's a worse Goldshire Footman, right? So um, a lot of risk and downside to this card, in my opinion. But there is one combo with this card, uh, and and a card that has never seen play, which is the Grand Tournament card Bolster. It's a two-mana spell that gives your taunt minions plus two, plus two. Now, there's never been enough taunt minions in Warrior or good enough taunts to really make that card see a lot of play. Uh, Just very fringe decks occasionally, and and really not even good ones then. But with Protect the King, suddenly you can summon seven 1-1s for three mana. And and against decks like Zoo, sometimes it's going to be pretty easy to summon four or five. Uh, Especially in the mid-game, like turns four, five, or six, if they drop Forbidden Ritual and load up the board, uh, you can summon seven dudes and play Bolster. And you've got a two-card combo that gives you seven three threes. Uh, so you, you'd get a 21-21 on the board for five mana. So that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, but the problem is it's not good against control decks that only play one or two minions at a time. Uh, it's really good against Zoo, granted, but that's not every matchup. you got to have both cards by the mid-game, so there's some risk with card draw consistency issues. So I just don't love Protect the King. I think some people actually like this card, but uh, in Warrior in particular, you have so many whirlwind effects that affect the entire board. It's going to be hard to put together a deck with good cards without just killing your own minions here, right? Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a new kind of Warrior, which we haven't seen before, and I don't think it's going to be better than the kind of Warriors we see now, which are super reliant on Ravaging Ghoul and sometimes Revenge, depending on the kind of deck. Um, so... This does not synergize very well with either of those cards, and uh, I just don't think this one's going to take off. I, I, it has the potential as a raw power and combo kind of card to be good, but I just don't think it fits into the meta as we understand it right now. So moving on to the final card 
In this review, it is the new Warlock spell, Kara Kazam. This one's a five mana force of nature. Excuse me, it's Kara Kazam. Uh, but very similar to the new form of force of nature for druids. Also actually pretty similar to Silver Hand Knight, the five mana neutral minion. Uh, that summons a 4-4 and a 2-2. But instead of a 4-4 and a 2-2, this time around it's actually a 3-3, uh, a 2-2, and a 1-1. One, one. So you get three minions, but the same stat total. And same stat total as Force of Nature as well. So uh, Blizzard seems pretty happy to summon 6-6 six, six worth of stats across multiple bodies for five mana. Uh, that feels pretty good to them apparently because it's a common uh, design theme. And a little boring if I do say so myself. But how good is this card? Um, I actually don't think it's great, and I, I believe most people agree with that sentiment so far uh, from what I've read. Uh, essentially, it's a little too slow for Zoo Archetype decks just because um, you know you, you want to life tap into cards with Zoo a lot, particularly around like 5 or 6 mana. And if you life tap with 5 or 6 mana into Karakazam, you have an unplayable card. So... You really do want your average cost card in Zoo to be three to two to three, really, and sometimes four mana. You know, you'll see one or two five drops in Zoo, or sometimes Sea Giants, depending on the deck. Uh, sometimes a Leroy, right? But on average, you can't afford too many reload cards. And this is essentially a reload card, a board reload card. If the opponent clears your stuff, you cast Care Exam, and you've got more stuff. And that's what Zoo wants to have is stuff. Uh, but Forbidden Ritual is so much better at that than this card because of its mana flexibility. If you life tap on six mana into Forbidden Ritual, guess what? You can summon four four worth of stats across four bodies. On six mana, if you life tap into Karakazam, guess what? You have an empty board for an entire turn and you lose the game. So uh, Forbidden Ritual is really good with its flexibility and it only takes a very small stat penalty. In other words, uh, for 5 mana, Forbidden Ritual, you get 5-5 five, five in stats. In this card, you get 6-6. Six, six. Now, of course, 3-3s three are better than 1-1s one, in some regards, particularly against classes like Warriors. So there's some upside there. Um, but still, I just don't think you can pass up the flexibility here. This one's a little bit too high-costed for what Zoo wants to do. So you might see this in more mid-range or control-style Warlock decks. But first off, those aren't that prominent. And even in a Reno-style deck... I don't know that you care so much about loading up the board with little stuff. You're typically looking for more impactful plays than that. And you don't have a lot of things to combo off of small boards. It's susceptible to stuff like your own Hellfire in Reno style decks. So I, I just don't see this card finding a home. It's not objectively terrible by any means. But I just don't think it fits into any deck as we see it right now. And uh, I don't think it's great for Warlock who's reliant on... Uh, life tapping and early to mid game strength. Uh, I've seen some people say it's really good with Chogall, and that's that's true. I mean, it's uh, it, it is good with Chogall. It's a free set of bodies, and you can also play the seven seven that is Chogall. But Chogall hasn't taken off yet, and uh, there's just not enough good spells in Warlock to make Chogall consistent. You can't expect just one card to make Chogall good, and you can't rely on Chogall to make this card good, so that just is not a combination that works very well in my mind. So, Karakazam, unfortunately, it's probably the cutest or funniest card, depending on how you look at it in Hearthstone, or maybe the most disturbing, given that it summons living household items. <laughs> but, unfortunately, not very good, I don't think. I don't think we'll see Karakazam very often. So that's going to wrap it up. For part three of my one night in Karazhan cards, unfortunately, I don't think any of these are that good. Big consistency issues with Malkazar, a lot of risk with Protect the King, and just an awkward fit with Karakazam means I don't really think any three of these will be big parts of the metagame anytime soon. Although, keep an eye out for those crazy fatigue Prince Malkazar decks. I have a feeling there's going to be a good one that shows up, and I might even try to make it myself. If you have any questions about my comments or my review of these cards, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, game on.